that, could we just uh, center ourselves in prayer right now? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Good and gracious God, we thank you so much for this mild fall day, for the gift of your creation. We thank you for allowing us to gather in your name, to learn and discover everything we can, to grow deeper in our faith, and to grow in relationship with one another. We thank you for Al. We ask that you bless this presentation. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Al McCauley to you. Al is the Director of Formation at St. Anthony on the Lake Parish in Pewaukee. He taught theology and history at Pius High School in Milwaukee, and for 24 years has been a religious studies adjunct for Cardinal Stritch University. Al is the creator and host of the weekly YouTube web series, Fish on Fridays. It's fantastic. If you just go on YouTube, type in Fish on Fridays, Al, you'll find him. He's, it's fantastic. I, that's how I discovered Al during the pandemic. Uh, he, well, I didn't discover him. <laughs> 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 I discovered him. <laughs> Uh, he's a frequent speaker for parishes and school faculties throughout the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. He earned his master's degree in religious studies from Cardinal Stritch in 2009. He is married with three children and one grandchild. It is my pleasure to introduce Al McCall. Uh, thank you. I said this yesterday to the group. I know what you're all thinking. I'm not old enough to have a grandchild. Thank you. Very kind of you. Um, I was mentioning before, I'm, I'm the youngest of six children. My parents had six kids in seven years, and I'm the first, all of us are married, we have kids, I'm the first one to be a grandpa. Being the youngest, it's really kind of an odd you know, dynamic We have family gatherings, but it's great nonetheless. Um, I gotta tell you a joke, can I tell you a joke right off the bat? Usually they tell speakers never to tell a joke right off the bat, because if it fails, then the whole presentation's downhill. So, so hopefully this will go, but you know, Sue mentioned something about the All Saints parade, or dress up as saints. There was a story about a priest who, who told his parish kids, if you dress up like a saint and come to the rectory for, for trick-or-treating, I'll give you a full-size candy bar. Not those little ones, you know, they call fun size. Like peanut M&Ms are my favorite candy, and fun-sized peanut M&Ms have like five in there. If it was really funny, it'd be like a pound bag. But anyway, so the priest says, if you dress like a saint and you come to the rectory, I'll give you a full-size candy bar. So Halloween night comes, the first kid comes to the door, knocks, and says, trick or treat. And the priest opens the door, and there's this little kid wearing a brown robe. He's got a rope around his waist. He's got sandals on. He goes, oh, St. Francis, with CC. Full-size candy bar for you. A few minutes later, another knock at the door, trick or treat, it's a little girl. She's got a tinfoil shield and she's got some tinfoil on and she's got a banner. And the priest says, oh, you're showing of art. Wow, here's a full-size candy bar for you. A few minutes later, another knock at the door, trick or treat, and it's some kid in a dog costume. And the priest says, I told you, I'd only give a full candy bar out to someone dressed like a saint. He goes, I am, I'm St. Bernard. <laughs> That's the kind of humor you could expect all night. Time. It's not going to get much better than that. The bar has been great. Um, I, I'm really glad to be here. Um, the conversation tonight is going to be about Christ as covenant. As Sue said, that's going to kind of be like the theme that the kids are going to be learning about. And um, so this is kind of like an overview of that. And I want to make, right off the bat, I want to make a distinction between a covenant and a contract. But first, because we're talking about Halloween, I think it's important that I give you a public service announcement. I don't know if you're aware of this. But you should check your kids and your grandkids' Halloween candy this year because there's paper, little pieces of paper in their candy bars saying we've been trying to reach you regarding your cards extended warranty. Um, <laughs> just gotta be careful, you know. Could be worse, I suppose. Um, what do you think they're trying to do? If you know if you get calls like that that say, hey, extended warranty, do you get those calls? Yeah. Am I the only one? Yeah. All the time. And what are they trying to get you to do? They're trying to get you to sign a contract. They want something from you, and, and they're hoping you want something from them. And it brings this, this, this question up is very important to consider, is what's the difference between a contract and a covenant? Do you have any thoughts on that? What would be a difference between a contract and a covenant? Contract's legally binding. Yeah, good. Contract is legally binding. Good. Anything else? That word binding is important to understand the contract. Anything else? What do you think of when you when you think of covenant? Do you think legal? Spiritual. It's usually spiritual. That's what I do. Yeah, I think of that. 
Let's look at this. A contract has to do with terms and conditions. Do you have you know, the fine print? Terms and conditions don't apply. They apply. The, the fine print in any coupon or any kind of ad, um, there's always some kind of limit. There's always some kind of thing you have to do. With a contract, it's restrictive. There's a duty involved. So I sign a contract in my place of employment. I have to do certain things. I can't just not show up. I have to show up and do my job. And by uh, in reverse, they have to do something as well because they've signed it. What do they have to do? They have to pay me a fair wage, you know, that kind of thing. Make sure I have vacation time, all that kind of thing. A contract is typically individually centered. It's about what can I, what, what do I have to do and what do I get for signing this contract? And what's the other person doing? They're saying, what do I get from this person and what do I get out of this whole thing? So it's about the individual more than it is about others. Contracts can be broken or amended. Just watch the world of sports, right? People are always want their contracts redone. Um, and if it is broken, sanctions can be made. Now, I taught at Pius High School for 24 years. I taught theology and history. And I, I didn't know this toward, toward, toward the last few years of my employment there. But there was a little clause in our contract that said if I left without giving one month notice, I would have to forfeit $1,500. What if, why did they put that in there? Why'd they, why'd they put that clause in the contract? So you leave them high and dry. Yeah, they want me to bolt. They want me to just leave. You know, there's sanctions. If I don't adhere to this contract, there's, there's a penalty, right? That's just the way it is. Now let's, let's you know, look at the contrast of covenant. The covenant is an unconditional bond. You know, it's a bond, but it's, it's, not, it's not like a contract's bond. It's unconditional. There's no conditions to it. It's liberating as opposed to restrictive. So I have a covenant with my wife. We've been married almost 30 years. Does it mean it's all perfect? No, of course not. But out of love, it's still freeing. I get, I, I'm freed by that love. It's not something that's restrictive. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Covenants are mutually concerned. It has to do with how I feel about the other. Think about a covenant with God and his people. It's because of God's care and love for us. And we respond to that, hopefully, out of care and love for God. It's mutual. It's not just about me. Unlike a contract, the covenant is timeless, it's unchanging, and it's unbreakable. And lastly, as opposed to sanction, I keep my covenant, there are blessings to be had. So it's the exact opposite in a lot of ways. But they're not the same. So I think that's important just to start right from the get-go. And I want to point this out because I think this is important. When we talk about a covenant being liberating and of love, I love this quote. We celebrated his feast day a few days ago. John, the, uh, Pope John Paul II. Love consists of a commitment which limits one's freedom. Love consists of a commitment which limits one's freedom. Can you think of an example where that applies? I should have said this from the get-go. I'm going to ask questions today. <laughs> the teacher and me. Who said that? Your children. Your children. What do you mean by that? Oh, I are you free. you have children? I'm assuming you're not you're not 100 free to do what you want when you want. Are you kidding me? And why not? Because you love them, and it means I have a commitment. And so I am. You're exactly right. I'm going to limit my freedom because I love them. Can you think of another example? Marriage. 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 Yeah. You know, there's a lot of things I would love to be able to do, but I can't. Why? Because I'm not. It's not just about me. It's about my wife. It's about our kids, etc. So I've made that commitment, right? I don't want you to, like, on the way home tonight, if you're here with, like, a significant other, don't talk about those things you would do, because that's, that's not a good thing. That's not a good, that's not a good way to treat your covenant. Um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is the reality of it. The, the idea is, that, and the other example I would say is God to us, you know, and, and us to God. There's certain things we're limited by with our covenant to God. But we do it out of love, out of our love relationship for God. We want to behave a certain way for what God has done for us. Okay? We don't often think of that term. We think of I have to do this, not I get to do this. And that's a, that's a fundamental you know, shift in the way we look at things. All right. So I'm going to give you three definitions today. And this is the first one, covenant. And the bold-faced line up at the top. It's a solemn agreement in which mutual commitments are made. And I love this. I don't know if you can. I'll just read this. I'm going to this guy. God sitting in heaven saying, I'm unfriending Ted. He keeps trying to tell me when I'm supposed to show up. How many times is our prayer life like this? Where it's like, I don't talk to God until I need something. Someone's sick, I need a job, I need money, I you, you want something better in my life, whatever. Then I'm going to go to God. And that's the only time. 
And so he says, you know, I'm afraid of him because, you know, he's always trying to tell me where I'm supposed to show up. As if that's the one-way street, you know? That's not a covenant. That's a contract. All right. I'm going to give you a, a video example of a covenant, okay? Hopefully the, the, the volume's up and everything else. You know who Charlie Brown is, right? I always hated it as a kid. I was like, look at your point. Sorry. <laughs> contract. Do you understand? Do you see that? Restrictions, fine print, all that kind of stuff. Contract. And someone suffers, right? It's not fun. It's not a good thing. Here, here's Covenant. This is from a movie called When Harry Met Sally. So you get, you see that idea, the more of a covenant, yes? I don't care that you have these faults. I don't care that you have those problems. I really want to, I love you. I just, I don't care. I'll take it all, right? I'll give up those freedoms. That commitment that I want to make to you is be, putting up with all that kind of stuff. The little things on your foot sheet and things she's not. I don't know if you, if you know uh, Star Wars. Are you familiar with Star Wars? Yes. Does anybody know who this character is on the left? Anakin Skywalker. Anakin Skywalker. And do you know who he becomes? Can you see the shadow on the ground? So that's Darth Vader. If you're not familiar with Star Wars, Darth Vader's like the real bad guy, okay? He's the real guy. And, and most people probably know that. But this young man is going to become. So this is a, an example of foreshadowing. And this is the second word I want to introduce you to. It's a warning or an indication of a future event. It, it, a lot of different synonyms up there. But for sh foreshadowing, I love this. Is this going to be in the test? I wish I had a dollar for every time a student asked me to add five. Is this going to be in the test? Um, I'd be a rich man. Foreshadowing is very important to understand covenants because to understand the covenants in the Bible, we have to understand that what's written in the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. St. Augustine said this. As Catholics, when we read the Bible, we need to be aware of the Old and the New Testament. Everything in the Old Testament is going to foreshadow or point to Jesus. And everything in the New Testament with Jesus is going to point back to and fulfill what was said or done in the Old Testament. Does that make sense? So it's really important to understand that. This is one of the reasons we have at almost every Mass an Old Testament reading, and it connects somehow to the Gospel reading, because they're supposed to speak to each other and speak to us by extension. So Vatican, Second Vatican Council put out a document, 16 documents, four constitutions. One of them was called Dei Verbum, which is about the Bible, how Catholics should read the Bible. And it says quite you know, very, very openly that God orchestrated salvation history and reveals himself through covenants. And there are four major covenants in the Old Testament. Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and they all culminate in Jesus fulfilling, fulfilling, fulfilling them. You've heard of Noah? Yeah. You've heard of Abraham? Yes. Moses? Yes. David? Yes. Awesome. So we're going to look at each one of these and how they foreshadow Jesus. And I'm going to do this through art. I'm going to stop for a second and say, in the last several years, about the last 10 years I was at Pius, I taught theology my whole time there, but I also taught history. I taught AP European history, and I got to teach art history, and I got to go to Europe, and I got to go to a lot of different places that had art. And one of the things I came to realize is that Catholics have a treasure trove of art that we just don't realize how, how graced we are with this. We have art that we can understand and we can be reaffirmed in our faith. And it's important to understand it and to, to try to look at it. And so I'm going to do that with you a little bit throughout the course of uh, our time together tonight. So this is Noah. How do you know this is Noah? Just by looking at the painting. You see an ark, and what else do you see? Rainbow. rainbow. Because God made a covenant and said what? I'm going to put a rainbow in my sky to show you what? Promise that I will never do what? Flood the earth again, right? And Noah, because it's a covenant, what are you going to do? Believe him. Actually, yes, you're right. He doesn't have to do anything but believe it. This is a really a one-sided covenant. God is saying, I'm never going to destroy the earth by rain. I'm never going to flood the earth like this again. And I'm going to put my rainbow in the sky as a sign of my covenant. We know this. So you might say, well, how is that fulfilled in the story of Jesus? 17th century Dutch painter Rembrandt painted dozens and dozens of things. He only made one seascape in his whole career, and this is it. The storm on the Sea of Galilee. And I love this painting for a lot of reasons. There's a lot of praying you can do with this. In fact, there's a whole form of praying called Visio Divina. 
sacred seeing. You, if, have you heard of Lexio Divina? Which is reading and praying and putting yourself into the gospel or into the Bible story. <clears throat> in this case, Visio Divina is really kind of similar, but you pray on art, on sacred art. Now keep in mind, 1633 this is painted. Most people in the room in 1633, if we were in 1633, couldn't do what? Read. We couldn't read and write. We were illiterate. Most of us were. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to have to read art. We're going to have to look at the clues that these artists put in there. And they didn't do it on accident. This is, and there's, they, 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 artists had a commitment to make sure that the truth was preserved in their work. Because the camera wasn't invented. There was no camera until the middle of the 1800s. Okay? So everything about abstract art and how I view things becomes more prominent after the camera. What we're interested in as artists back then is we have a sacred obligation to make sure that people who look at our art understand consistently what the truth is. Does that make sense? It's remarkable how similar or how many of these clues are in age after age, artist after artist, no matter where they live, they encode clues, if you will, into their art so that we would know the truth. Let me ask you a question. Do you ever go to church and are you ever distracted? I'm not the only one, am I? One of the great gifts of the Catholic Church is you look around and what do, what do we have in our churches? Stained glass window and? Statues and? Banners and colors. And we have um, all kinds of stations of the cross. And we have all kinds of things, right? So when we're distracted, we can still look around and be affirmed in our faith because of what we're seeing. Does that make sense? That's, the, that's genius to me. That's beautiful because it's always reaffirming what we believe. All right, let's look at this a little bit. Before I zero in on it, I want to just point out from the get-go, <clears throat> Rembrandt paints this very specifically. He puts the mast of the ship in the shape of a cross. He wants us to know something. To the left of that cross is all light, and to behind it is all shadow and dark. And he's saying to us, in you and I, when we have storms in our life, when we suffer, when we have any kind of conflict, what are we going to grab to grab for? What are we going to hold on to? <clears throat> are we going to face the light or are we going to face the dark? Because the cross has overcome the darkness. It's fascinating to think about this. Let's look a little bit deeper into the, into the boat here. Can you, do you know where Jesus is on this? He's right there. He's the lowest point in the boat. Rembrandt wants him to be the lowest point because he is the anchor of our lives. When times go bad, when we do have those storms, it's Jesus that's going to be the anchor that's going to hold us solid. He's going to be the person we cling to. Look at what some of these, these uh, let me see if this works. Yeah, look at how, look, how tightly they're gripping to the, they're trying, what are they trying to do? They're trying to save themselves, aren't they? And this is, this is like prayer. When we pray, do we use prayer like a vending machine? It's what I want, when I want it, how I want it, as opposed to, what God's will is, you know, the cliche of is, is prayer your steering wheel or is it your spare tire, you know? Is it something you just pull out when you need it and you've tried everything else yourself or is it something that guides you? These people are looking, you know, for help. They're trying to save themselves and really what they need to do is they need to look to Jesus. Now, if you count the number of men in this boat other than Jesus, there's going to be 13 men. Now, you might say, well, wait a minute. How many apostles did he have? How many disciples? 12. Why is it 13? Because Rembrandt liked himself. He painted himself into the image. <laughs> that's, right. that's, that's true. That wasn't uncommon for painters, for artists to do that. He put himself and he's looking right at us. Almost as if to say, what are you going to do? What are you going to cling to in your storms in life? How are you going to cling to Christ, if at all? This, by the way, Rembrandt used his inspiration for this from Psalm 130 in the Old Testament. Psalm 130, it's a prayer called the De Profundis Prayer. From the depths of my suffering, Lord, I cry out to you. What do they say? This is in Mark 4. Mark chapter 4, okay? Let's go back to Noah for a minute. What happened to Noah and the earth? Flooded. God says, I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky. It's never going to happen again. That's my covenant. What are the, what are the apostles on this boat saying? They're like, help us, Lord, do you not see that we're perishing? What's Jesus doing? He's sleeping. It's in Mark 4, Mark chapter 4. Jesus is asleep in this storm. And they're all like trying to save themselves. And they look at Jesus like, what the heck, dude? What are you asleep for? And so they're like, Jesus, why are you sleeping? Don't you realize we're dying from the depths of our misery, Lord? Save us. This is an echo to Psalm 130. And what does Jesus do? He gets up and he says something. He's, he woke up, he rebukes the wind. 
And he says to the sea, quiet, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was great calm. Jesus fulfills what God's promise was. These disciples, and by extension, us as disciples, we as disciples, will not perish in that way. We are meant for more than that. If we but trust and claim to Christ. So just as Noah was saved and God promised no earthly destruction by flood, the disciples are showing us Jesus has that power just by speech to calm the seas and to control the weather and control nature. It's pretty remarkable. Does that make sense? Noah, first covenant. Do you remember the second? Abraham. Abraham. Excellent. Abraham. And this is a really weird covenant, really wacky because it's like violent. In Genesis 15, God says to, to Abraham, he says, this is what I want you to do. We're going to make a covenant, buddy. This is what I want you to do. I want you to collect a bunch of animals. <coughs> I want you to get a three-year-old heifer, uh, yeah, three heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, some birds. I want you to cut them all in half. And I want you to separate the two halves. Make like a path between them. That sounds crazy, doesn't it? I said yesterday, I think the people at PETA would be pretty upset with that. But, um, you know, you cut these animals in half, and you're like, what is he doing? God is going to tell Abraham, I want you to walk between these animals. And I want you to only do that if you're willing to take this covenant on and promise me that you'll be faithful. Because if you walk through these animals and you don't, you know what you're saying? You're saying, let my sin then end up, the result be like these animals. Let me be cut in half. Would you take that? If you're, if you're married, if you're sitting in this room right now and you're married and you had to cut it out of the, I don't know, if you ever break your covenant, you're going to be cut in half like an animal. I don't know. I don't want this. I don't want to hear confession times here. This is not, but you get the point. I mean, it's, it's a pretty serious thing. And God wants to show Abraham what to do, so he does it first. There appeared a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch which passed between those two pieces, the animal. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. So God goes first. He wants to lead the way. He wants to show Abram, no matter what you do, I'm going to be true, and I'm going to be faithful, and I hope you will too. Does Abraham walk through them? Yes, he does. And so the covenant is sealed. It's really kind of amazing when you think about this. The word covenant comes from a Hebrew word that means to cut. And what did he do to the animals? He cut them. You know, we don't often think of, I don't think of the word covenant as cutting anything. But a lot of people, a lot of historians will say the etymology or the origin of certain phrases we take for granted has its roots in covenant. Phrases like, I'm going to have a blood oath. That somehow a covenant has to do with blood. As Christians, do we have anything to do with blood? Yes, we do. Every time we go to man. The phrase cut a deal. Or the phrase walk the walk. God is saying to Abraham, listen, you can tell me. You can tell me you're faithful, but I want you to prove it. I want you to walk the walk now. Go between these animals and say, fine, if I break this covenant, this is what's going to happen to me. That's, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? That's tough sledding. That'd be a tough thing for anybody to do, because you know what? You and I are not going to be able to do that. First of all, I'm not going to want to cut up animals. Second of all, I, I, I know I'm not going to be able to be faithful like that. You think you will? I mean, the law is there, but we, we break it all the time, do we not? I used to tell my students, okay, this is your homework for the week, Monday morning. So on Friday, I want you to tell me that you committed no sin between now and Friday. <laughs> Think that happened? No. It's because we're human, right? It's going to be tough for us to live up to that covenant, but this is what God wanted of Abraham. Now, what does this have to do with Jesus? How is this foreshadowing Jesus? Because how many people were Jesus crucified with? Two, one on either side. Two men were going to be cut, <clears throat> separated, split, and they represent you and I. Those two men that are on the crosses on either side of Jesus represent you and I. Do you know their names? It's okay if you didn't. Dismas is the good thief, Dismas, and Gestus is the bad thief, the guy who... So on one side, Dismas, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Gestus says, one of the criminals hanging there reviled Jesus, saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. And then Dismas says, This man has done nothing criminal. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Would you agree that there are times when you are like Gestus and you're saying, God, why me? Have you ever, yeah? Would you agree with that? Are there times when you're like, God, thank you. You're, you, you, I praise you. Right? We're both. We're both. We represent one human reality that's been split in two. And who's crucified in between it is Jesus. He's, he's between those. Not if, if that's not enough, how, what happens to Jesus? Do they break his legs? Do they break his bones? No. What do they do? They split aside, they cut him. 
and his blood runs out. Okay, his blood in the water, everything that's left in his being runs out. So he is now that animal that's cut in two. He is now the animal in more than ways than one. He's between the human representation and he himself is cut. Why? Because we don't have to worry about that anymore. We don't have to go to mass and cut heifers and goats and birds. Isn't that a nice thing? I wouldn't want to go to mass if I had to do that. I wouldn't. Now, I want to explain this to you. This is really important for, for Jewish history, Jewish culture. This is a model of the temple, and the temple is kind of oblong, and there's a part in the temple called the Holy of Holies. Roughly translated, that would be like our sanctuary, where our tabernacle is. Are you with me on this? The Holy of the Holies. And this is what Jews believe. The Ark of the Covenant was in there. And the Ark of the Covenant is where the Ten Commandments are, are kept. Um, it's right there. And if you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, and the Ark of the Covenant is left there. It is in the Holy of Holies. And the Jews believe that the presence of God is there. It is so sacred to them that nobody can go into that room, ever, except for one person, the high priest. And he can only go in there one day of the year, Yom Kippur. And he can only go in there long enough to say one word. And that word is Yahweh, God. And they leave. It's that sacred to them. It's so sacred that they're going to have to kind of shield it from everybody else. Is there anybody in this room right now who is roughly six feet tall? Come on. Six, five, okay, say I could enough. What's your name? Jared. Jared? Yeah. Jared? Okay, six feet tall. Can we imagination? Six, the curtain, that curtain that I'm talking about that separates the rest of the temple from the Holy Holy is like ten of Jared's. It's 60 feet tall. 60 feet tall. And it's about four inches thick. About this thick. So imagine 60 feet tall, this thick, curtain. Wasn't he great? Thank you, Jared. Thank you. You got a future in acting, my friend. The curtain. What was that? What was that? That's a curtain? Is that what you said? Yeah. It's curtains for your career. Um, this, is, this is an important thing to understand. This veil is going to separate everybody in Israel from the presence of God. What do you think that might represent? Metaphorically, three letters starts with S. Sin. Our relationship with God is blocked. This veil represents that none of us are worthy enough. Uh, uh, worthy enough. None of us have access to God. We don't because of our sinfulness, and it's God is separated from us. Now, this is important. Remember, we're still talking about Abraham and cutting animals and all that kind of stuff. What happens when Jesus dies? You hear Matthew's gospel. Jesus cried out in a loud voice and gave up his spirit. And behold, the veil, ten of chariots high, four inches thick, the veil in the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. It has now been cut into two. The animals have been split. And what does that mean for us? Given everything I've just told you, now what does it mean about our relationship with God? What do you think? We have access to God. There's nothing separating us anymore. We don't have to cut animals. We don't have to do those blood oath things anymore. We just have to give our faith. We have to assent to that. Isn't that a lot easier? That is good news. I came to Mass here yesterday. I said this yesterday morning, and in no way patronizing. I was blown away by how you celebrate here. Your Masses were just, the Mass was just awesome. The music, you go to some parishes, and I've been around the Archdiocese enough to know that you go to some parishes, like, oh, you know, it's like, are you not happy? Are you not happy? What does that mean? Hallelujah. It means that God is now, he's available to us. We have access to him and he to us. And we don't have to split animals. That's great news. That's really good news. So anyway, splitting two. So does that kind of make sense? Hebrews puts a fine point on this in case we didn't get the, the point from Matthew's gospel. He, meaning Jesus, he entered once and for all into the sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption for all of us. So the covenant was fulfilled by Jesus doing it once and for all. Once and for all. So we don't have to. I love that. That's, a, that's really good news. All right. I want to just a little bit more with, with uh, the covenant with Abram. So the story of Abram, he, he has his covenant with God. They walk through the animals. He and his wife, Sarah, can't have kids, but then they're told they're going to have a kid, and they have a boy. Do you know what they name him? Isaiah. Isaiah. And Isaiah, he, this is his only son. He loves him, right? In Genesis 22, God comes to 
Abraham when Isaiah is about 12. I, I'm sorry, Isaac. I said Isaiah. Isaac, I'm sorry. Isaac. He comes to Isaac when he's about when Isaac's about 12, and he says to Abraham, hey, I want you to take your son. This is how it reads in the scripture. I want you to take your son, the one whom you love, and I want you to sacrifice him as an offering to me. What does Abraham do? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say, what? You know, in the ancient world, by the way, many religions, many cultures practice human sacrifice. So Abraham is probably thinking to himself, this is just one more God among others who wants me to sacrifice a human. And clearly, this is my firstborn. This is something is special to me. And God wants me to give the first fruits of my offering. So, and hence my offering. So, we have no indication if Abraham cried or if he was sad. Did he put up a fight? I mean, I don't know. Not to mention what Isaac is saying, you know. But anyway, it's interesting because we know that this is his beloved son. Now fast forward to the New Testament. When Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, the sky opens up and they hear a voice. A dove settles on Jesus and he hears a voice from heaven that says, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. It's interesting that both Old Testament, beloved son of our father in faith Abraham, beloved son of the father in Jesus. Make sense? Stick with that image right there for a minute, okay? When they go out to the place of sacrifice, Abraham puts the wood that's going to be used on the sacrifice on the back of Isaac and says, I want you to go out to the place of the Holocaust. And what happens in the New Testament? They put the wood of the sacrifice on the back of Jesus on the cross. Both beloved sons are going to be made to carry the wood on which they're going to be killed. Crazy when you think about it. It, it, it even further. Abraham gets to the point where he's going to kill, uh, kill um, Isaac, sacrifice Isaac, and the angel of the Lord comes and says, don't do it. Remember this story? Do you ever think, what's Isaac doing? Do you think Isaac had to have some kind of therapy after this? I, I, I love to think that it's like, you know, next summer Abraham says, Isaac, let's go camping. <laughs> Bring the wood, Isaac. Come on. So he does it, but what does Abraham do? He still wants to offer something in thanksgiving to God. And he looks around and he spies a ram stuck in a thicket. It's caught in the thicket, in the thorn branches. Now, what do we know about a ram? It's a kind of sheep, right? And a ram is what kind of sheep, gender-wise? It's a male, okay? And what do we know about Jesus? They put a crown of thorns in his head. He is the lamb that has the thicket in his head. It's very important that we understand this. And he's a male lamb that's going to be sacrificed where Isaac wasn't. Jesus fulfills that covenant. Jesus took it all upon himself so that we don't have to. And that's good news. That's why we should be singing hallelujahs. That's why. We're Easter people, man. We're risen. The worst has happened, and it's been, it's been corrected. It's been fixed in Christ, uh, Christ's resurrection. All right. No. So we had Noah. We had Abraham. This is the third. Moses. I don't know about you, but I cannot think of Moses. Unless I think of Charles Mastin. Ten Commandments, right? I love how they talk back then. You, ever, you know, there's a line when he hears that God's going to wipe out the first board, and Charles Mastin says, Turn from thy fierce wrath, O Lord! You know, I, I remember we were, when our kids were young, I used to walk around like that, and they'd say, Are you going to be mad if I, you know, whatever, I'll say, I'm going to turn from my fear. They, they would they roll their eyes. <laughs> that kind of movie wouldn't fly today. That kind of acting. Would you agree with that? That over-the-top emotion, you know, he's like, oh, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> so dramatic. Anyway, Moses. So we've talked about uh, the, the Noah and the Abraham co uh, covenants, and all of us talk about the Moses one, the one with Moses. And this one is pretty simple in a, in a way. There are, the, the Israelites are enslaved, and God says to Abraham, I want you to free my people, and I'm going to open up, you know, a lot of hurt on these Egyptians. I'm going to give them plague after plague after plague, nine in fact. And they still haven't changed their mind. The tenth plague is going to be a doozy. It is going to be what? Kill the firstborn of everybody in Egypt. Unless you do something that has to do with blood again and killing animals. It's the deal. What are you going to do? You have to take a lamb, a male, unblemished lamb from the ranch of the, the, the goat to the sheep. You need to, you need to slaughter it. And you need to put its blood over the... That's a great Halloween decoration. Are you going to run home and do that? Don't. Um, blood over the doorpost of your front door. And the angel of the Lord is going to pass over, and seeing the blood, you will be saved. So the blood of the lamb is going to save you. What kind of lamb? Male, unblemished. 
right? How, was John the, how does John the baptize, uh, Baptist introduce Jesus to his disciples? He says, there is, behold, the Lamb of God. He is the one now whose blood will be shed so that we can pass over not just human bondage and slavery, but slavery to sin. Make sense? So the Lamb of God, I mean, that just takes on a whole new meaning when we sing that before communion. Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world, right? Have mercy on it. We sing that three times, that Lamb of God line, because it's so important we understand. By the way, this is not up there, but the Day of Atonement, I mentioned this before, for Jews, Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement. you got to get right with God so that you can usher in the new year, Rosh Hashanah, a week later, okay? And what did the Jews, I'm going to simplify this, what did the Jews in ancient Israel do, and even today to some extent, what did they do on, on a Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement? The clan or the family gets together, and they foist on this male lamb all of their transgressions from the previous year, all of their sins. They pray about it, they meditate about it, they think about it. It all goes into, symbolically, into this lamb, which is then slaughtered. And when it is slaughtered and it's dead, so are their sins. That's how they're atoned. That's how they're forgiven. Again, Jesus is the lamb of God. It follows that same parallel. So God made a covenant with, with Moses and said, listen, I'm going to free you like you've never seen power like you've never seen before you know wonders that you've never seen before and jesus is like i'm going to free all of us from the from the bondage of slavery with things you've never seen before like resurrection of the dead and then ascension into heaven all right so there's a piece of art i don't know if you i, I love i can tell you i love art have you seen a movie called monuments men or heard of it yeah. if you haven't you really need to watch it it's fantastic um, one of the central pieces of art that's featured, it's, it's a tr based on a true story. Um, this piece of art was made in uh, the Northern Renaissance in the 15th century by a guy named, a guy named Jan van Eyck, and it was stolen by the Nazis. And so a lot of the story <coughs> has to deal with getting back pieces of art. But anyway, I digress. There are 12 panels there. Just to give you a sense of the size of this, this is an altarpiece. It's called the Ghent altarpiece. Do you, remember, you know back in the day, before Vatican II, if this was the altar and I was the priest, I'd be like this most of the time, right? And you'd be viewing my backside for the mass and the high parts of the mass. And we'd all be looking together at that. The altar pieces would sit behind the altar so everybody could see it. And what do you see up there? You see Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. You see angels worshiping. There's Mary. There's John the Baptist pointing to the Lamb of God, Jesus, who's king, who's now the Savior of the world. And this is the part I want to focus on, this middle part down here. By the way, this whole thing together weighs more than two elephants. And it's about the size of a two-car garage door. That's how big it is. It's, it's, each of these are 12 panels. You can't just pick the whole thing up. You have to take it one panel at a time. It's absolutely huge. So I'm going to go, I just want to go back here to show. So that bottom panel in the center, do you see that? This panel right here? I'm going to blow that up right there. It's called the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb. From the four corners of the earth, they're all coming to worship the Mystic Lamb. Okay. See at the very bottom in the center, right above the words of and the, is the baptismal font, which leads us to the altar. So if you zero in on the altar even further, you see across the, uh, the front of the altar in Latin, it says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And you see the, all the angels that are adoring Jesus, the representation of Jesus, the mystic lamb. Remember, lamb is important. Lamb is very important. This is part of the covenant with Moses. Okay? Just to go further, can you see the angels and what they're holding? They're holding the implements of his torture and death. On the left, you see the cross. You see the, the nails and the crown of thorns. On the right, you see the, the scourge, the whip, and the lance that he was stabbed with. And we think about that. When we go to Mass every time, we don't, that, we don't have to do any of that. We don't have to cut animals. We don't have to be cut ourselves. Jesus did this once and for all. And because of that, we have everlasting life. And this is all part of the promise to Moses, the, the idea of salvation. In Hebrews, again, for this reason, Jesus is the mediator. What's a mediator do? They go between, right? Yeah. As if to go between two sets of animals. Or splitting the two of the curtain in half. For this reason, Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. He's the new and everlasting covenant. Since a death has taken place, Jesus is, for deliverance from sin under the first covenant, those who are called may, be rece may receive the promised eternal, eternal inheritance. The covenant with Moses is finalized with this. What's he getting? Ten commandments. Okay? 
This is very important to understand this too. Why does God give him the Ten Commandments? It's because they, the Jews, the Israelites, need to know how to live. How to live a good life. Okay? So you know the story. Israelites are free, right? From the day that they're free to the point where they go to Mount Sinai. Why do they go to Mount Sinai? Because they have a broken arm. <laughs> From the point of when they leave to go to Mount Sinai, what do they get on top of Mount Sinai? Moses gives them the Ten Commandments. It's 50 days. From day of release to day of Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments is 50 days. On their 50th day, God gave them the law so the Israelites would know how to lead a good life and to live a good life. You with me on that? 50 days. The Jews celebrated this every year on a feast they called Pentecost. Pentecost means 50th. On the 50th day, we Israelites received the law so we know how to live our lives. You with me on that? Okay. In the Christian context, what do we celebrate? 50 days, Jesus rises from the dead. We're all free from our, our connection to sin. 50 days later, we're given something so we know how to lead a good life. What is it? The Holy Spirit on Pentecost. So it's fulfilled. Make sense? Now, what's important about that or cool about that is Jesus tells us all about this even before he dies in something called the Beatitudes. The Ten Commandments are really a foreshadowing of the Beatitudes. And this is really a, a very important, but I want you to understand. The Ten Commandments are what? How does each of the Ten Commandments start? Oh, Thou shalt not. The Beatitudes are the why of our faith. How did each one, how did the Beatitudes start? Blessed, Blessed are you. It's not a contract anymore. Hey, you, shan't, you should not do this because something's going to happen. Contract. Covenant. If you do this, you're blessed. And so are everybody around you. If you're meek, if you're humble, right? All of, if you're a peacemaker, all of those things. <clears throat> That's the covenant. So the contract has been morphed or changed or broadened, expanded to be now a covenant. Does that kind of make sense? I think that question of why we do stuff instead of the what we do is really an important one to ask. Every time I go to Mass, not every time, but a lot of times, right, if I'm dragging my feet, I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I, I just have to sleep in today. God bless you. Sometimes I'd like to just sleep in. I'm like, okay, that's the what is getting my butt up and going to church. What's the why? Why am I doing that? That's an important question to ask. Why am I going to Mass? Why am I saying my prayers? Why am I doing anything I do? I'm going to show you a brief video clip somebody asked yesterday. This guy's name is Michael Jr. He's a comedian who inspires with this comedy. He's a Christian guy, but he's, he's funny. And it's about a two, two and a half minute video clip that talks about that what and the why. And I hope it, it helps make, uh, solidify this a little bit. That's amazing, isn't it? It's and that's the difference between what? That's, like, that's the difference between Hallelujah. and Hallelujah. I know my why. I know my why. I don't have to cut birds and calves anymore. I don't have to do any of that. That's been done when Christ died on the cross and he rose. I have faith in that, and that's, I get to live that truth now. This is when we go back to Moses, the what and the why. We got the Holy Spirit, man. We've got grace that, that empowers us to do these things, to recognize it and then to live that way. So we should all be singing like the second version of that guy. You want to start? Go ahead. One, two, three, go. <laughs> all right. Fourth covenant, David. Right? Who was the first? Water. Noah. Second? Abraham. Third? Moses. And now David. And this one is very quick, very simple. In 2 Samuel, God is talking to David and he promises him something. He says to David, when your days are completed, when you die, basically, he says, I'm going to raise up from your offspring after you sprung from your loins, I'm going to establish his kingdom. He it is who shall build the house for my name and it will establish the royal throne forever. This is Old Testament. This is a thousand years before Christ, a little less than that. Okay? What happens? At the Annunciation, we're told in Luke 1, and we hear this reading every year on December 8th by the Immaculate Conception, which is the conception of Mary, but we hear this anyway, the Bible verse in Luke 1. Behold, the angel says to Mary, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. You shall name him Jesus. He will be great, called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father. 
Now, I don't know if you've ever thought of this. If you've ever wondered to yourself, well, wait a minute, Jesus technically isn't the offspring of Joseph because the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. So how is it that he is in the line of, of David? Have you ever thought of that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The question is, or the answer to that is that in the ancient world, especially in the Jewish faith and the people, the, their culture, was that if you were a man that married a woman whose husband was a widow, let's say, and had kids, as soon as you are betrothed to her, as soon as you are married to her, her children are now yours, as if they were your own blood children. They get every right, they get every kind of thing that follows from that, every benefit. So when Joseph marries Mary, Jesus is every bit his son as if it was his blood son. Make sense? Because Joseph, the line of David goes through Joseph to Jesus. That's why I'm saying that, okay? So the covenant that, that God says, I will take someone from your line, your heritage, and I will raise up an eternal throne. Here we are, 2,000 years after Jesus, and we're still in this room talking about this guy. You know? So the fact is, it's, it's, it's been eternal, at least for 2,000 years, you know? I love this painting. I just want to do a little teaching on this painting. Matisse's version. The, the, the Annunciation is one of those wonderful paint, uh, things that is depicted a lot at Raphael. A lot of different people have, have depicted it. And I like this one a lot. There's a lot of symbolism going on here. If you were to do a uh, look at different images of the Annunciation, there's going to be some similarities in most of them. Maybe not all, but a lot of them. For instance, you're going to see those chubby little baby angels. Do you see those? Those are called cherubs or cherubim. Now, there are nine levels of angels that we're told about in, in, the, uh, in the Bible. And the one that's closest to God, that hovers around the throne of God, praising him, that would be the highest ranked angels, if you will, will be cherubim and seraphim. Now, how, do you, how as an artist do you depict the pure innocence and love that floats around the throne of God? The closest human thing would be a baby. Pure innocence, pure love. Right? Complete dependence. And so you see a bunch of chubby little baby angels in art whenever heaven comes to earth. The Annunciation, the birth of Christ. That's why you'll see them on your Christmas cards in a few, in, in a few uh, two months or so, whatever. Um, but that's why you have chubby baby angels. You see the angel Gabriel on the left holding the symbol of purity and peace, the lily. You ever notice that Mary's always wearing blue? Blue represents divinity, heaven. It's the closeness or proximity to the divine. She's always in blue in some shade of blue. She's got a, a mantle or a veil over her head to represent virginity. Head's always bowed in humility, because it's never about her, it's always about her son. Trick question, why do Catholics worship Mary? We don't, we don't. good answer. We only worship God. Mary sh says that every piece of art will show her like this, downcast, not because she's not worthy, but because she's humble, because it's all about her son, it's not about her. The one throwaway that I love pointing out here is this at the bottom left, uh, right hand corner, do you see that like, cloth that's just randomly put there? Many, many representations of the Annunciation have that there, and it's really supposed to be its own piece of foreshadowing. That Mary is present at two of the most pivotal moments in history. She is going to take her son as he's newborn and wrap him in swaddling clothes, and then she will be with him when he's taken down from the cross, wrapped in his shroud, and put into the tomb. So Mary is going to be present at both of those key events, and it foreshadows what her life, what her yes to the angel is going to mean for her, is a lot of suffering. What's the definition of love? A commitment that limits one's freedom. Mary's freedom is going to be limited. Do you think she wanted to see her son killed like that? No. Absolutely not. This is covenant. This is, this is love. She said, fiat, let it be done let it be done to me as you say. We say something similar every time we go to communion or end of prayer. We say amen, right? And I love this version. St. Paul says to the Corinthians, For in Christ, this, this whole sentence, by the way, this whole verse just explains what we are as Christians. For in Christ is found the yes. Who is it found in? It's something that you and I did. We can't boast. But it's in Christ. It's Christ that made us be able to say yes. We believe in everything that I've talked talking about, how he's fulfilled all these covenants. And so because of our knowledge of that, we say, yes, I want to, I, I buy into that. I have faith in that. To all of God's promises. Therefore, it's through Christ that we say amen to give praise to God. And that's what we do when we go to Mass. We don't go to Mass to get, be entertained. We go to, to praise God. That's, that's the first thing we do. Right? <clears throat> um... We say that. We say, may the Lord accept, accept the sacrifice at your hands for what reason? For the praise and glory. And not that, not to that. For what else? Us and for everybody else. The whole world. 
for the whole church. That's what we're saying we next to. Now, why do I have this picture up here? Because amen comes from a, a ancient culture, and amen was a, a, a stake in the ground. If you were fortunate enough to own land, you would put your stake in the ground, and you would say, this is mine, amen. And now there are three things legally binding on you when you own that land. There are three things you have to do. You have to affirm it. You have to make sure everybody knows it's yours. Okay, affirm it. Second thing you have to do is you have to defend it so nobody can take it. And third, you're going to have to promise that you will cultivate it so it produces fruit, not just for yourself, but for the community. You have to affirm it, defend it, and cultivate it so it grows. Think about this next time you go to communion, and you walk up, and you say, body of Christ, and you say, amen. Are you willing to affirm, I'm going to say this publicly? I'm going to live my faith publicly? Am I going to defend my faith when needed? I don't mean, you know, but to have knowledge of my faith so I can say, I don't know if that's right, let's have a conversation. Will I cultivate it? Will it, let, will it bear fruit in me so that people will see it? So I live that gospel truth? Amen is loaded, man. It's a loaded word because we, we just say, yeah, that's yeah, fine. But it, it means a lot more than that. It's based on that covenant that Jesus established. All right. Just as a, I just think this is funny. Oh, I hope I'm not running out of time. Am I running out of time? A little bit. Oh, oh. You know, I'm going to come to the chase. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to see. Uh, People used to sign their names with X. You know that you know I'm talking about? Why? Because they were illiterate. illiterate. X comes from the first letter of the Greek word Christ, Christos. And so they would say, in Christ, I believe this. I, I will, this, this, it's a signature of Vera. Thomas Sayers, his mark is X. In Christ, I will keep this contract. And you know what they would do oftentimes? They would kiss it three times to represent the Trinity. Like we kiss the Bible or something. Because they want you to know that they meant it. Which is interesting because that's where we get our X's from, like XOXO, kisses. It has its roots in that. That's one way of keeping a contract or a covenant, is in Christ. I want to talk, the last thing, and then I'm going to be done. I'm going to try to get through this quickly. Um, the reason we should be grateful to God, if I, among other things, is that we don't have to cut animals. That we have God's grace that inspires us to live out our faith. You know the story of Peter and, and John, and their, or Peter and Andrew, and they're trying to catch fish all day and they can't? You know this story? Yeah. Luke 5. And then Jesus says, hey, go out one more time and cast your nets. And it's, ah, oh, we've been busting our butts all day. Are you kidding me? But okay, fine. They go out one more time and did they catch fish? A ton of fish. Is that because of Peter's expertise as a fisherman that they catch so much fish? Absolutely not. It's God's grace. But it only worked, God's grace only worked because he went out again and he threw his net out again. Think about how many storms we've been through, how many times you've been through things you've said, I've been praying for this for so long, Lord. i got to throw my net out one more time. Because if we don't, God's grace works with us when we do those things. The, the, the miracles can be profound, but we just have to keep trusting and having faith in that. This is really important to understand. Grace is God's freely given, undeserved, ever-present help, help. So this is my analogy for grace. And I hope, if you need to leave, it's not going to hurt my feelings, but I hope you'll stay for two more minutes. I want to finish this up because um, it's important. Imagine if I shut the lights off in this room right now and it's pitch black, so you can't even see your hand. You with me on that? You're all sitting here and it's pitch black, and I say, now I want everyone to leave. What's going to happen? Chaos. Chaos. You're going to bump into things and hurt yourself? Bump into each other and hurt them, Right? That's, that's a problem. Would you agree that there's electricity enough in this room to light it up so we don't have that problem? Yeah. Think of that as grace. So it's in pitch black. We're together here in pitch black, and somebody gropes over to the wall and finds the light switch and flips it on, and now there's light. And now I say, okay, leave. What's going to happen? A lot less chance for there to be chaos or for you to hurt yourself by bumping into something or to bump into others, right? A lot less chance. This is the key question. The person who gropes over to the wall and finds a light switch when they turn it on, are they responsible for the light? No. no. They cooperate. God's grace is like the electricity that flows through this room. We All we have to do is flip on a switch. We don't have to wire the joint. We don't have to put in the light bulbs. We don't have to do any of that stuff. We don't have to pay the bill. It's been paid. All we got to do is flip the switch. Our part is really minuscule. That faith. And why do we grope for the walls? Because we have faith that that that's going to happen. God will not abandon us. And so we do that. Now, 30-second clip. Do you know who this guy is? Bono, lead singer of the group U2. Okay, it's a rock group. And he's a Christian guy, and he was interviewed, and he gives a great example or metaphor for grace. So I really, it's 25 seconds long, literally. But I think it's really profound.
That's what grace is. I want, I want the song to sing me. I don't want to sing the song. It can't be all about me on that boat in Rembrandt's painting trying to pull the sails and stuff. At some point, I want the song to sing me. God's grace to work. And when that happens, I just try to be present. It's effortless. It's easier. It's easier. That's what grace does for us. It gives us that idea of saying, this is not just about me. God has got this, but we just have to cast our nets. That's all we do. Flip a little switch. That's it. And all we have to do is be useful. That's, that's a, to me, it's a great metaphor. The last line I'll leave you is with this. You don't get to heaven. You don't get to heaven because you leave a good life. That's the what. You leave a good life because heaven is got to you. We're not, we're not getting paid. There are no wages here. God's not saying, well, you've done X, X, Y, and Z, so now you can get into heaven. He's saying it's been done with my son. Respond to that love and just be what you're called to be. Be people of love. Be people of faith. Be people of grace. And that's it. Heaven has got me. I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm blessed. So let's act that way. Let's sing hallelujah. Let's sing amazing grace, you know. Not the first way, the second way. <laughs> okay, I went a little over. I apologize that I took your time. I do want to make a shameless plug, though. Um, this was, uh, this is, in fact, one of the silver linings of COVID was this web series I started. I won't get into the details, but it's a weekly web series. We've had over 130 episodes now, over two years I've been doing this, and it's five to ten minute little episodes about the life of saints or teachings of the church. Some of the pieces of art you, I talked about today touched on, the, the uh, uh, altarpiece of Ghent, the Rembrandt piece, and more, a lot of others. I do a lot of that kind of stuff in there. It was a way during the lockdown to keep in contact with the parishioners where I work, and uh, it just kind of took on a life of its own, and it's just been really, really fun to do and something I love doing. So if you're interested, you can scan with your, your smartphone that QR code, and it'll take you right to our YouTube page. I make no money off of this. This is all evangelization. I just love doing it. And if people want to watch, I'm happy to have you watch. Um, thank you so much for, for staying longer. I apologize for the line. Thank you. Thank you, Al. And I'll think of something very creative. If you ever watch this of Al, of this uh, series from Al, uh, tell me who the who the image is at the beginning oh, of, yeah, his, uh, of his of his of the series. So just watch it. You'll you'll see. We have our own theme song and everything. Oh, <laughs> a former student of mine is in a jazz band, and he made it. He, oh, he did a, an arrangement of um, "Ode to Joy" by Beethoven. It's a little jazzy. So check it out. <laughs> That's, <laughs> awesome. That's true. Well, thank you, everybody. Our next uh, event, if you look on the sheet, is in a couple weeks. We'll be doing uh, Breaking Open, the story of Noah. So we're going to take all of what I cannot believe, Al, that you did all of that in an hour and a But we will be kind of, now we're going to be breaking all of those open for the rest of the year. So when you come, and, and we'll be doing that kind of stuff. But gosh, thanks for coming, you guys. Have a safe trip home. Thank you, thank you. And thank you once again. Good night, everybody.